Good morning. Hopefully now technology and something will appear. Hmm. Let's see. All right. I want to begin with a personal acknowledgement. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here today, to, be, to speak as one of the Friends of Evidence, and to come literally in the footsteps of Alice Rivlin. When I began my professional career in 1970, one of the first things I read was systematic thinking for social action. For some 40 plus years, Alice has been a friend of evidence. And it's, uh, it's a great honor to be following her today in um, having an opportunity to talk to you about some of the work that we've been discussing in the Friends of Evidence. Um, my work now really focuses on schools and educational systems. When I began back in 1970, I was working on Planned Variation Head Start and working on something then that was thought to be an extraordinary innov innovation, which was comprehensive family, children, and educational services from birth to age five. Forty years later, we've come back to what the Brookline Early Education Project was trying to accomplish. Anyway, my starting points for the conversation today. We confront this growing chasm, in my view, between unmet social needs, rising aspirations, and what our social institutions are routinely able to accomplish. We have an R&D system that's trying to address these issues, but in general it's too slow, it's too expensive, and most significantly the findings are often of limited value to the people on the ground who are actually trying to solve the problems of child family welfare, how to better educate our nation's children. The goal that we need as Friends of Evidence is a system where we can learn faster and better in order to achieve quality outcomes reliably at scale, and especially this idea quality outcomes reliably at scale is the theme of my remarks and central, I think, to what the Friends of Evidence are trying to address. Looking at this through the lens of work currently in education, we are following trying to mimic the control trials paradigm developed in healthcare in which someone has an idea they design an intervention. They do this randomized control trial. Typically, it lasts about five years. And we generate some evidence that something can work. And the key word here is can. Because when you think about what a randomized control trial does is some people get treatment, some people don't. We measure on an average difference between the two groups. And if it's, there is an effect size, that an average difference means for somebody somewhere, something good happened. But we typically don't know for whom and where and under what set of conditions. That's the kind of evidence we generate. What's supposed to happen is that it goes into something called an education, the What Works Clearinghouse, which typically takes another 18 months or so. And then it goes on an approved list. And uh, people are supposed to buy these things off the approved list and implement and quote unquote implement them with fidelity and then, voila, practice is supposed to improve. Well, there's, um, there are major practical and even more significantly conceptual problems with this view about how we get better. First off, in the What Works Clearinghouse, if you actually go and look through it, there are a little less than 900 items, elements, that have, been, that have actually met some standard of evidence. Um, many of these are actually the form of null findings, which technically tell us nothing. Uh, and to just compare this to, and that's over about 20 years of work, there are more, much more entries uh, appearing now more rapidly. But just to put this in perspective, in contrast to medical practice in just one year alone, 2010, there were 27,000 clinical trials in medical practice. And this has been building for four decades. So the idea that somehow this body of evidence is actually going to tell us how to really improve what practitioners do on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a great aspiration, but it's nothing we're going to 
see, likely to see in our lifetime. But there's also a deeper problem. And it's really important to understand what this kind of evidence tells us and also what it doesn't. That the genius of randomization, which is of course at the heart of these kinds of studies, is the ability to isolate a single factor and its effect on some outcomes and to willfully ignore everything else that affects those outcomes. But that's also the limitation of this strategy in that everything else is what actually produces the wide variability and often quite unacceptable variability in the outcomes that we continue to observe. And so if we're actually about trying to get quality outcomes to occur reliably at scale, we need complementary forms of evidence. It's important to know that something can work, but it's even more important to know how to make it work on the ground, hands of different kinds of people, working with different subpopulations of children, families, communities, working under very different organizational conditions. That's the kind of evidence that we need if we're ultimately going to get quality outcomes to occur reliably at scale. That goal drives us in a somewhat different direction. In the work we've been doing at Carnegie, we've talked about this as the problem of learning to improve. And we've organized this, this work around six basic principles. In the short time that I have this morning, I'm going to focus my attention on the second and third of those principles. But along the way, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on the others as well. All right, number two, variation in performance is the problem to solve. As I've already alluded to, the critical question is not what works. In fact, if I had my way, I'd expunge this concept uh, from our discourse. Because to say we, th we know what works means to suggest it doesn't matter where we try to do it or who tries to do it or, under, or who we're actually trying to serve. And that just belies the re social reality that we're actually trying to address. That coming out of the quality improvement perspective, the way quality improvement would ad address this problem is to actually ask a different question. How do we advance effectiveness among diverse practitioners, engaging varied po populations, and working in different contexts? And the goal, again, is to achieve efficacy reliably at scale. And what does evidence look like to do this? Now, I'm going to start with what, at least in the context of education, would be an ideal case where you might think the, the current paradigm would actually be very helpful. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to show you some results from the first year results from a very large randomized field trial. This is a $40 million study of reading recovery that is being done under the um, I3 initiative. And the key thing about this design is that it was designed as a multi-site trial. Let's see for a second why that's important. And I call this an ideal case because if there's a place where a control trial might generate really convincing evidence in education, this would be it. Because reading recovery is a one-to-one -one tutorial, so it takes a lot of the complexity and messiness of classroom, of managing classrooms and, and school organization off the table. There's 20 years of research that stands behind this initiative. Anybody who actually does this has to go through a year of specialized training. It's as good as it gets in the field of education at trying to get high quality implementation of a standard treatment. So what do we see from the first year trial? Well, a remarkably large effect size. The education effect size is around 0.2 are really commonplace. The effect size coming out of the first trial, out of the first year of the trial is 0.7. This looks really quite remarkable, although not inconsistent with earlier evidence. But what's also interesting that comes out of the multi-site trial is that it begins to give us evidence about the variability in these effects across the different schools in which this uh, intervention is actually occurring. 
And in about 20% of the schools, we're seeing weak outcomes, in some cases slightly negative outcomes. And this, is, this I should add, is a quite expensive intervention, at least by school standards, because it costs about three to $4,000 per pupil to actually do this. So you typically want big effects. So you've got a number of communities where this is going on where you'll continue to generate responses. It just doesn't, reading recovery just doesn't work because it's not working for us. And the other thing that's really quite interesting is that the other end of the distribution, there also are some positive deviants. And when you're looking at variability in performance, you're worrying about, well, why is it not working on the left-hand side? What is it about? Is it something about the subpopulation of students? Is it something about the training of the particular teachers who are doing it? Is it something about the way it integrates or fails to integrate well into that primary uh, a program of instruction. What's, what's wrong there? And on the other end of the distribution, somebody, somebody's probably figured out something to make this program even better. But we don't know what they're doing either because we typically are neither studying our failures nor trying to learn how to improve from our successes. So, but th and this example, which really is intended to talk about the variability in performance, again, is a best case example. What you'll typically see in education, the average effect sizes will be smaller, and you'll still see this much and even more variability in effects going on. So that, that this focus on just the average differences really misleads us from what we need to pay attention to. We're gonna get quality reliably at scale that any treatment, any intervention will typically have widely varying effects, and that variation in performance is what we have to work on. The third principle that I, I, I laid out is this idea of seeing the system. And this little display up here comes out of uh, some work that we did with an improvement team in the Baltimore City Public Schools in which they're very much concerned about the um, trying to improve teaching in classrooms and particularly the experiences of new teachers and they were prepared as this new evaluation data on teachers is coming forward to introduce a new protocol for feeding back data to teachers to improve. But rather than centrally developing something and telling everybody they got to implement it as we developed it, the first step of it was, well, let's go out and actually learn something about what new teachers in our schools are experiencing. And this is a visualization produced by that team of what a new teacher in the Baltimore Public Schools is likely to experience in terms of the number of people coming into his or her classroom and giving them some advice. Well, all you gotta do is kinda look at the display and think that, well, chances are creating another protocol and putting it on top of that is actually not gonna solve the problem. That we have a system here, each of the pieces of which is typically here for a good reason, but when you put all the pieces together, this just doesn't work as a coherent system for improving practice. So that's kind of this idea of seeing the system. Now, typical approach to supporting <coughs> teachers in schools is this idea of introducing instructional coaches. And a lot of districts have done this. And typically, from a policy perspective, well, you got to figure out where you're going to put these people in a salary schedule and hire and you got to hire them, assign them to schools. Uh, you might have to deal with provisions in the collective bargaining agreement to get this off the ground. And so people then are going out in the schools and, and we expect great things to happen and changes in, for example, teachers' content knowledge and uh, the way they, um, quality of instruction and, you know, and that in turn is supposed to then create um, improvements in student learning and so on. Sitting between the policies and the outcomes that we uh, aim for is this um, proverbial black box. And when you start to look inside this box, well, what actually has to happen for this policy to actually produce quality outcomes reliably at scale, you begin to see that, well, there are, there are sets of processes that have to be developed. Coach is a new role 
being put into a school. There are new role relationships to form. There are norms, there are productive norms that have to occur in order for this all to work together. And a material weakness in any one of these elements and the outcomes that you desire are unlikely to occur. The solution is itself a system, a complex new system being brought into a school that has to interact with and be adapted to an existing social system. So when you think about it in these ways, it's not surprising we get great variability in performance. So if we approach this problem as we've conventionally done and ask the question, does coaching work? Well, I think it probably doesn't take very long to realize this is actually a silly question. Across many different fields of endeavor, we know that coaching can be very powerful at improving individual performance. There's a wonderful little piece in The New Yorker by James Sirowicki, I think the current issue of New Yorker, that actually talks about this. Across a wide range of fields, work on coaching has had the effect of greatly increasing the level of performance in those fields, and more importantly, greatly expanding the number of people in various fields who work at very high levels of performance. So there's good reason to believe that coaching is very powerful, but it's also a very human and socially in intensive system, make it work. <coughs> so that even when these initiatives are well planned out, you should expect to see variability in quality and actual performance. And that means that when we think about what kind of evidence we want to bring forward, it's evidence around what will it take to achieve quality reliably at scale again. This is the question where we need good evidence. There's a wonderful little TED talk by Atul Gawande a couple of years ago that he delivered when he talked about healthcare being in the greatest crisis of its professional existence. And healthcare is a wonderful example to think about because as a field, um, it has extraordinary science, there have been incredible investments in technology, its people are trained to the highest levels of any of our professions, it attracts extraordinary people. And yet as Gawande tells us, in practice, we still witness unconscionable levels of death and disability that occur in our nation's healthcare institutions. His argument is that the field pays far too little attention to how all these pieces have to come together to productively care for people. And so it's basically an argument about, a concern about how to achieve quality reliably at scale. And in including his talk, in Gwande's closing observation, he says the following. Making systems work is the great task of my generation of physicians and scientists. But I would go further and say that making systems work, whether in healthcare, education, climate change, and making a pathway out of poverty, is the great task of our generation as a whole. So seeing the system and thinking about how we build interventions that can reliably affect the outcomes we're after is the task. Here's an example of some work we've been involved in that, try to, that takes this approach. We start with a presenting problem. And this kind of improvement work always starts with a very specific problem we're trying to solve. Some 60 to 70 percent of the students who move into our nation's community colleges, and about, about, about half of the post-secondary education in the United States occurs in community colleges. And when you ask where minority students are more, more likely to go, when you ask where students from families where neither parent has a post-secondary education, this is, likely, this is most likely where they're going. So 60, 70 percent of these students will be assigned to developmental math courses. Upwards of 80 percent of them will never acquire college math credit, which means you can't transfer to a four-year institution, you can't qualify for many specialized technical vocational preparation programs. And every year, we send a half a million students down this pathway, every year. 
Well, as a truism in quality improvement work, if we continue to do what we've always done, we'll continue to get what we've always gotten. So what do we know about this? What is it possible to achieve here? Well, the, across the top panel is what routinely happens across a large cross-section of colleges that we've actually now organized data on. About 6% of the students acquire college math credit in one year, 15% do it in two years. We now know from direct work we've been engaged in that it's possible to triple that success rate in half the time. That's a really big effect, triple the success rate in half the time. Well, how do you do this? Well, it's about seeing the system. It starts with really trying to get deeply under the hood of why is it that we continue to get the dysfunctional outcomes where you've gotten. And there's no single simple answer as to why this happens. In doing this work, we've identified about a half a dozen primary causes of failure. Turns out we lose more students at the transition between courses that fail within them. And students go back and have to be told that they have to learn some things that they've already been exposed to in the past. Tends out not to be terribly compelling. Uh, it also turns out, moving down the list, that um, many of the students are disengaging. We know from talking with students, we know from existing research that students tend to disengage in the first couple of weeks if they're not going to continue. But unfortunately, we don't have any data on that. Institutions typically don't have any data on that. They don't know it till the end of the semester when the withdrawal rates or the failure rate data comes in. So says Peng, it, it points to a number of different problems. Well, understanding this system, this is what we think are the primary causes, then leads you in turn to think about, well, what would be taking this kind of system view, what are the organizing hypotheses for improvement? Well, the first one seems really straightforward. As soon as you realize, and this is a general phenomenon, transitions are bad things across wide ranges of, of social and educational cases. Whenever you see a transition, typically somebody's going to fall through the crack. All right? so, as soon as you see this here, where your students have to take typically two, three, or four courses to get to college math, take some of the transitions out, turn this into a coherent pathway, and you're really likely to just get some improvement from that. Uh, change the course materials so that students are coming in and doing college level math rather than being told you've got to go back and do math you've seen before. Um, many of these students come believing that they're not good at math, that they don't see the relevance and purpose of this. So how do we directly address issues of the mindsets they bring to classrooms? And of course, sitting at the center of this is, is faculty development, because faculty affect how the materials are going to be presented. They directly interact with students and therefore shape the mindsets that these students have about the work they're engaged in. And then at the bottom, this issue about the students being gone before we know it, when you suddenly begin to really focus in on that, then it becomes we need to start strong and we need data to tell us how strong we're starting. So it's, you know, we're, we've got these outcomes that are a year out, but if we're going to succeed, we really need to know much more about what's happening in those first two or three weeks. So, well, that then shapes the kind of evidence we start to look at. We're putting a lot of attention into, uh, into starting strong, and we're especially concerned about student mindsets, because we know these mindsets are predictive about whether they're likely to persist to completion or not. So we create what we call practical measurement. We work with faculty and we ask them, well, how much time can we get on the first day of class to actually get some information from students? And it comes back and they say, you can get maybe three minutes because that first day is really busy. So this, this then translates into, well, what's the 25 or so absolutely best questions we can ask of each student that are likely to be most predictive of their success in this endeavor, and especially most predictive, informative about what's happening in those first few weeks. So what do we see? 
Across the board, over those first three weeks, interest in math is up. This belief that intelligence is fixed, trying to convince students that with effort they can actually learn math, what's called a growth mindset, make improvements there, anxiety is down, uncertainty about belonging is also improved. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean what we're doing in those, in those first few weeks, we've got, we have perfect evidence that uh, the initiative is working, but there is data, and the data could object, and so far it hasn't, and this has been replicated over three years. But the other interesting thing about this is that we're producing this kind of data for every classroom and for every college, because although on average the numbers look good, it doesn't happen everywhere. And where it doesn't, it raises the question of, well, why is it that Frank's getting this kind of data and I'm not getting it in my context? So we now have data that's really informing a very local conversation about how we can learn better from each other. So that's one, one use of this kind of data. A second use, very different problem, is really a predictive analytics. We really want, as best we can on day one, to know who's most likely to succeed and who's not. And in the cases of those that are less likely to succeed, what do we do next? And in the first year of the data that was collected, it turned out one question asked on day one turned out to be the most predictive of students' subsequent success. And it was this question about how often, if ever, do you wonder, maybe I don't belong here? <coughs> question taps a very general social psychological phenomenon that we all experience. We work, we move, into, we, we move into some new context and there's this belonging uncertainty about whether I fit, whether I belong here. If we have doubts about that, to protect ourselves we withhold effort. We, and when, in the case of students withholding effort, that absence of commitment then subsequently um, tends to link to failure. The interesting thing about this, when this came forward, is that what we noticed is that, in general, as belonging uncertainty goes up, students are less likely to persist successfully to completion, and this phenomena is especially powerful for African-American students. So it actually taps into another thing we know about stereotype threat. Having seen this then, this then creates another round of inquiry, where we're now getting down, where, where participants in this network are now getting down to the most micro level about how faculty members are interacting with students in their classrooms, trying to reduce this belonging uncertainty and trying to enhance students' persistence to success. They're doing things called plan, do, study, act cycles, which is a very conventional technique in quality improvement. And here's an example of one. There, we spend a lot of attention, I've said already, on what happens in the first two to three weeks, but there are other places where students typically disengage. And faculty, one of the places where the faculty in this network started to focus attention is that about midway through the semester, right when that mid-course, that mid-semester exam occurs, right after that, faculty typically notice that students start disappearing. So attendance, which generally is up around 85, 90 percent, will typically drop to 60% and stay there thereafter. So what do we do about that? That then becomes a very specific improvement problem to solve. In this case here, faculty, the, a couple of faculty began introducing something called a group noticing routine, uh, which is students are working in groups in classrooms and each student is responsible for noticing whether another student is absent that day and if they are, sending them a little email note. Sorry, I didn't see you today. Uh, hope, you're come, hope you come to class tomorrow. If you need any help on what we did today, just send me a note. This group noticing routine actually seemed to change the pattern of attendance going forward. Now, this kind of stuff starts in just a very small number of places, which is very much in the spirit of this kind of how this improvement work proceeds. Can you get it to work anywhere? If you get it to work in a few places, the next question is, well, if we go from two or three places to 10 classrooms, it works in 10 classrooms, can you take it to 50 classrooms? The idea behind this strategy, using evidence to try to get quality outcomes reliably at scale, 
is that as you move out to more diverse contexts, you expect the practice to break. It won't work everywhere. And, that's, and when it breaks, that's what you want to study. That's what you want to get evidence on, because that's telling us how we have to, in some form or another, change the practice to get, out, to get positive outcomes to occur reliably at scale. So this is, not, this is not a process of gathering data once, proving that something works, and then disseminating it widely. This is the methodology of continuous improvement, constantly gathering data, constantly trying to get better at what you do. And we do the same thing at the network-wide. This is, this is some results for the first 19 classes, uh, colleges, that worked in, um, that have been working in this. And in this case, we're doing a fairly conventional analysis of where for every student who goes down a pathway, we have five very carefully matched students who are going down a traditional experience. So we're actually able to compare how well students in the pathway succeed as compared to uh, students following a more traditional sequence. And uh, in general, that triple the success rate in, in half the time, that's the dotted line, and each one of these is the results for a particular college, and uh, we're also able to do this at the, at the classroom level. And when we look at this, well, in general, the results look really good, but we also have a failure in one place where this just simply didn't work. Now, the normal temptation is, the tendency to say is, well, they, they just didn't implement it as we designed it, or we didn't get very cooperative people. There are lots of ways to explain that away. But from this point of view, this becomes an opportunity to learn. We have to go out there, and we have to really understand deeply why this happened. Because as this expands, chances are this is going to happen again. And so we need to learn there. And then we also have, again, a few positive deviants, the same phenomena, where in this case we've got a couple of institutions where the historical success rates are in the 10 to 15 percent range, and now suddenly they're up in the 80 percent range. So what are they doing inside this set of resources that actually are allowing them to accomplish that? That's kind of learning to improve. This is the real work of getting better at getting better. Finally, and uh, just to say something about why structured networks. This is, an ob this is something we've learned a great deal about in the last 10, 15 years, the power of large networks, particularly driven by the, by the fact that with the internet we can now see these large networks and l learn a lot more about what they do. In any large, in any large net network, this is a potentially an enormous source of innovation because we have a lot of people doing the same kind of work. Chances are somebody somewhere has figured out the answer to some problem I'm concerned about. But typically, we don't know who those people are or where they are or what specifically they've learned. But if we can structure, as in these cases, people working on improvement in networks, that learning that individual practitioners are doing, that individual site directors are doing, becomes now a resource for others to improve. So one is it's a great source of innovation. The other thing is that we know that innovations diffuse not because we have great evidence, or not alone because we have great evidence, but because people know people who've used it, and they trust them, and we rely heavily on social judgments. So structured networks increase those kinds of communications. Another thing that happens when this kind of work is done in large networks is that patterns that may be very hard to see, like that result on social belonging I showed you, in any one place become much more apparent when you're able to see these kinds of data across a large network. So that's another thing from which we learn. And then the fourth thing that happens with these networks when they're properly structured is that these become very safe environments for participants to discuss comparative results and to learn from them. We know that comparative results can be very powerful in improving how organizations function. But we have to structure this in a way that these interactions are actually in a learning exchange. 
Oftentimes, when people first get data, it doesn't look very good on their particular context. They want to discount the data. It's, you know, there's something wrong with the measures. It doesn't quite apply in our situation. But when, it, when these networks are properly structured, this changes into a learning exchange of the type I illustrated before where, again, using Frank as an example, Frank and I are colleagues, and suddenly I realize he's got better results than I do. The natural question is to ask, well, Frank, exactly what did you do to get that? That's precisely what we want to have happen and how to use evidence on the ground to improve. The other thing we see in this work is that when these um, conversations about comparative results are occurring, they can also form this kind of moral imperative. If others can get this, why can't us? Right? Very different than the accountability uh, imperative because here it's now self-generated rather than being imposed from outside. All right, so to close, using evidence to get better at getting better. I'm fond of this quote from Don Berwick, who is, uh, as uh, many of you know, is the founder of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and was one of a very small group who was instrumental in bringing the quality improvement movement into healthcare. And Don says that the problem that is managing quality is not just an intellectual endeavor, it's a, pra it's a pragmatic one. The point is not just to know what makes things better or worse, it's to make things actually better. And it's really that, in that spirit, I think, that the Friends of Evidence, what is it we need to know, what kinds of evidence will actually help us make things better? If I were to describe this work, try to put this work on a bumper sticker, albeit a long bumper sticker, it would be the following. It's all about learning fast, to implement well, to achieve quality outcomes reliably at scale. This, in my view, is what the Friends of Evidence is about, and I think it brings vitality to what Alice, again, what Alice Rivlin sketched out some 40 years ago in her just very prescient remarks about the importance of systematic thinking for social action. So, I thank you. We are a little past our time, and so we're going to have two or three questions, but the dialogue about the issues that Tony raised uh, so beautifully are going to go on all day. I see a question uh, back here. Uh, Anand, do we have a mic? Good. Great. Thank you so much for that eloquent talk, and it's great to see you again, Tony. Uh, Laura Levitin from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, I am a huge fan of the rapid cycle improvement methods you talk about, uh, but after hanging out with a lot of these improvement scientists for uh, quite a few years, uh, I also know all the warts and pimples. <laughs> And I think we want to be as critical in our use of these methods as we are with experimentation, for example. Um, I can tell you I want you to get, get you over to uh, London with the Health Foundation because they, um, those of you in the health field probably know a celebrated case of the use of quality improvement um, with the state of Michigan, all the hospitals, greatly reduced their central line infections through a quality improvement process. However, when this was taken over to Britain, no effect. It's like the worst thing that ever happened to the Health Foundation. Um, a recent article um, in BMJ Quality and Safety indicates that uh, for an appalling number of people using the rapid cycle method, it's done pro forma, it's not done well. Okay. Maybe we need quality improvement strategies to improve their quality of using quality improvement. But most disturbingly, um, when Don Berwick and IHI try to spread um, what is, is demonstrably uh, great ideas for quality improvement, they can't seem to make it stick. It is often not sustainable. It often does not generalize within the institution. So I still love it. I know it works. Thank you. 
uh, but I wonder if you have any thoughts yeah. about those issues. Uh, we, we tend to be enamored with methods, all right? And the randomized control trial is a method, the plan, do, study, act cycle is a method, and we tend to think about these as, as almost like the equivalent of, well, this is, this is our drug. You know, we're going to use this drug instead of that drug, and we're all going to get better. Uh, in in uh, pursuing this work, I've become a deep student of quality improvement in healthcare, and have been particularly interested in studying the history of its development and and learning about organizations where it actually has gone deep to try to understand what does it take for this to transform an institution. Uh, Cincinnati Children's, and I, I think Rob, uh, Rob's here, is one of the places where we've had a study team out, and. It's very, uh, it's very, and it's very important to not just look at what they do, but try to understand how an institution came to work that way. Um, in, the, in the case of uh, Cincinnati Children's, and I think it's true for a number of these institutions, it starts very small. There's a CEO with leadership. There was a person who was brought in who was really passionate about this, Uma Kataga, and it started working in a couple of small units places where, where, they, um, where they could really demonstrate success. It then grew to a few other units. They started to build capacity, a uh, number of people who could do it. And over a period of time, they actually transformed the way an organization works. So it, but it's not simply, it's very different than coming in and saying, well, you're all going to do PDSA cycles tomorrow because this is, the, this is the, the new intervention. And the interesting thing, actually, about that work is that Robert Wood Johnson, the Pursuing Perfection Initiative, was actually critical in, in the growth of this, where it's been successful in healthcare, and more times than not, when you, when you hear somebody, when you find a place like that, and they start asking, well, how did you get like that? People are gonna tell me, oh, uh, we were part of Pursuing Perfection. So uh, this, none of this is automatic. Tony, Jill Constantine, Mathematica Policy Research. Yeah. Um, Mathematica, along with other partners, directs the What Works Clearinghouse on behalf of the U.S. Department of Education. So you might guess where I'm going. You might not. Um, so just a point of um, information. Uh, the Clearinghouse actually does not generate an approved list that the department says these are approved and districts you can use them. That's a misnomer that apparently is still out there. But I just want to make that clear. Um, I also would, a good discussion for today, I don't think we learn nothing from null results. We don't learn everything for sure, but not nothing. Uh, but that said, there is great potential in education research in particular for these questions we're grappling with because it's always local, it's always contextual, and it's never in the uh, laboratory. It's, as I say, real kids, real messy, right? So why don't we learn more uh, from endeavors like the Clearinghouse about what works for whom, and as you importantly point out, and why? Well, after having uh, sat over reviews of more than 10,000 effectiveness studies, there's two main reasons we don't learn. First is people actually don't report it, or they don't report it very systematically. So we have our research colleagues out there who aren't doing a very good job of that. Uh, but secondly, and actually more common, is they never studied it, okay? So especially now, uh, that a lot of studies are based on in education administrative data. Uh, this isn't just for you, Tony, the, one of the conversations today, the power and the peril of administrative data uh, and measurement is it's much easier to do pretty well designed studies, uh, but you can do them without ever walking into a school. So this point you're getting at, we really have to learn how and why um, I think uh, all the threads of evidence uh, would be very supportive of, um, but uh, we're not necessarily going down that path. So I wonder if you have some thoughts uh, about that. Well, yeah, one of the, I think, one of the real organizing principles around quality improvement, uh, and that shows up across a very wide range of industries, when you see really high-performing organizations, what you will see is that the people on the ground floor doing the work are centrally involved in the improvement of the work. And that's a really important observation, that they, they don't get to be high-performing organizations by evidence being delivered on top of them. Sure, they use everything that's known, but the people who are doing the work are 
actively involved in improving it. And that, that is a central, and I think a very different perspective on how we're gonna get to quality whether in our, in our education, child and family welfare initiatives. That it's not, it's not just simply, my caricature, buying something off a list and assuming you're gonna get positive outcomes. That inevitably, these programs that we're engaged in, as I've tried to suggest, are themselves complex solution systems. They're gonna be integrated into a local context, which itself is a very complex social entity. Inevitably, there's gonna be adaptations that have to occur, and the people on the ground who are doing the work have to learn how to make that happen productively. That leads us to a di different forms of evidence, different forms of inquiry in order for that to happen. And both need to be valued. One more question over here. Sure. Uh, thank you. My name's Charlie Homer. Uh, I lead the National Institute for Children's Health Quality, which does uh, quality improvement work, much like you described in, in children's health care. This really question is at the intersection of these two talks. I wonder, in the first talk, Dr. Rivlin challenged us to say that, that uh, some of the folks who won the election challenged sort of our underlying assumptions about the role of evidence, and particularly the role of social policy. One of our beliefs about quality improvement is that you're generating these data locally. Education is certainly an area where politics comes into play quite a bit. And I'm just wondering what your experience is running some of these large national networks, whether you're able to bridge the um, blue-red divide uh, and use these data to actually drive local social policy change in progressive manner. We, uh, this work, the community college work is now going on in some 50 plus community colleges and uh, I never actually thought about the states that it's happening in, in terms of what are red and blue, but I know we got both. Um, it has a different, it has a very different feel to it because it, it uh, people coming together around solving a problem they care about. Um, they're engaged in this because they think this organizing framework for improvement, which has come about through lots of conversations with faculty, educational leaders, it it makes sense to them. And of course, there is voluntary association. I mean, these are colleges that want to work in these kinds of ways. In that sense, it has a very different dynamic than someone at the state level saying that someone else has told us that you need to do it this way. Um, so I think in that sense, it's a more, much more productive dynamic. Uh, I think from, if I were to think about this from federal policy perspective, what part of what I would, I mean, I think we should be, I wanna be really clear, I think we should be doing what we've been doing in trying to do these randomized controlled trials, finding out about things that what can work, because they become, I think about them as building blocks for solutions, not the solution. Uh, but I'd be equally concerned about how government could support the development of these kinds of capabilities in every social institution in the United States, how something like what uh, what Robert Wood Johnson was able to catalyze in at least some places in healthcare, how do we catalyze more of this kind of activity occurring in education, and then federating it? That's the other part of it, the network part, because there is this power of learning from each other, uh, and that's a place where I actually think red and blue can actually come together, because this is no longer. I know what the right answer is for you. I'm here to build capacity so that you can figure out what the right answer is for yourself. Tony, thank you. Let's express appreciation for Tony one more time. <laughs>